Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. This episode is sponsored by handweaving.net, the comprehensive weaving website with more than 75,000 historic and modern weaving drafts, documents, and powerful digital tools that put creativity in your hands. Now it's simple to design, color, update, and save your drafts. Handweaving.net's mission is to preserve the rich heritage of handweaving and pass it down to you. Visit handweaving.net and sign up for a subscription today. This episode is sponsored by Trainway Silks. You'll find the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. Choose from a rainbow of hand-dyed colors. Love natural? Their array of wild silk and silk blends provide choices beyond white. Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Anne Merrow. Michael Cook is a fiber artist and sericulturist based in Texas. He's known for sharing his knowledge and experiments in silk rearing, processing, and fiber art through classes and his website, wormspit.com. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Of course, it's a pleasure. So you're sitting at home in your studio, and my first thought is that you have some sort of moth ornaments attached to the curtain behind you. (laughs) But I just realized that they actually may not be ornaments at all. Is that right? Yep. Those are real alive moths, and they're... The big ones are Anthrea polyphemus, which is one of our American silk moths, and the little tiny one is a Bombyx china silk moth. That's a female. And... They're because they're nocturnal and they're in a bright space. They're all kind of just chilled out, waiting, and so they're not they're not going to do anything unless it either gets dark or somebody pokes them. Now, when most of us think of silk, we are thinking of like super smooth, shiny, silky white bombyx mori. But that's not what you have hanging out with you today. There are wild silk moths around the world. We have a I've raised about a dozen species of our North American kin. And they're, they're in a slightly different family from the China silk moth. China silk moths are in Bombicoidae, and the North American silk moths are almost all in Saturnidae. So these are Saturnid moths. Um, I like to call this one Texas Tussa. It is not endemic to Texas. It lives here, but it lives all basically from east of the Rockies and north into Canada. And so there's there's a lot of them. They eat oak and birch and beech and several other tree leaves, but they make a very tussa-like silk. The colonists actually made efforts to raise them on plantations so that they could make silk from the cocoons. It was not really successful. They're very definitely a wild animal. They're not a domesticated animal. I can raise them in a shoebox in the same way that you could have a pet raccoon. It's not going to make it a domesticated animal just because you keep it indoors. And so Bombyx has been so thoroughly domesticated that they are dependent on human care and they're adapted to contained culture. And so they're very, they're domesticated. We've actually domesticated them so much that we've changed their genome. So I don't, I don't know how into that you want to get, but they're in number. The number of chromosomes that they have has been altered by successive years and, and millennia of breeding. And so they can interbreed with their wild type now, which is Bombyx mandarina, but they're a completely unique, like, like a chicken. It's not a wild animal at all, or a cocker spaniel. I've seen a lot of books that will say Bombyx mori no longer exists in the wild and Bombyx mori never existed in the wild. Bombyx mori is a human creation. Just like that cocker spaniel, you're never going to find, you know, herds of wild cocker spaniels on the steppes of Russia or anything like that. But a lot of people think that the breeding has kept up and there are none of the wild type left and that is not the case. There's a wild moth called Bombyx mandarina. It flies in Eastern Asia, China, Japan, parts of Russia, that whole Eastern Asian area. And they are considered a pest because everything that Bombyx mori, our domesticated type, can eat, they can also eat. And every disease that our domesticated silkworms can catch, they can also catch. And so you have to try to keep them off your mulberry fields 
without spraying anything on them or treating them with anything noxious or anything that works. <laughs> so it's, it's a challenge, you know, working with the wild ones. So I obviously know you in the realm of silk textiles and your work with weaving and embroidery. And so in my mind, you just like happen to raise silkworms. But as I hear you talking, you clearly spend a lot of time thinking about raising silk moths and silkworms for their own sake. Which direction did your interest lead you? So it's actually two kind of convergent paths. So I was always interested in bugs as a kid. I, I, I read a lot about them. I studied them. I went around in the woods and turned over logs and looked at all kinds, you know, climbed trees and found all sorts of interesting insects. I lived in the woods north of Houston when I was growing up. And so we had all kinds of slugs and butterflies and moths and centipedes and snakes and lizards and all sorts of different things. And so I would go out and, and, and look around at those. And at the same time, I was learning how to, to embroider and then to sew and then to crochet. I didn't learn to knit until college. And I actually taught myself knitting in college and spinning. I had like a lesson and then kind of went off and taught myself a lot because a lot of what I was wanting to do was not what my friends were doing. I wanted really fine, really even, really the same. And everybody else was like wanting bulky and interesting and arty and that was not the yarn that I wanted to make. I wanted to make very fine, consistent, small stuff. And so I learned in, I guess it was like 96, 95, something like that. One of my, I was living with a friend of mine and her daughter's teacher had a quilting unit and the kids each made and decorated a square and then the moms got together and sat and quilted. And, and my friend couldn't go in, so I went in and I creeped all the other moms out because I had my own thimble and I made short, even, clean stitches and I knew what I was doing. And so they all sat there in awkward silence. And the teacher and I had a lovely conversation. And she told me about you know, all of her, her textile interests and she knitted and crocheted and did all kinds of things. And we were talking about my weaving and I said that I weave with silk. And she said, I raise silkworms. And I, I didn't know you could raise silkworms. And she said, yeah, they live in a shoebox and they're a perfect unit in the classroom because they don't bite and they don't stink and they don't fly away. And the food that they eat is readily available and easy to get. And then they go through their whole little life cycle and then they mate and lay eggs and you put the eggs in the refrigerator and that's your next, your next year. And I said, wow, that was interesting. And I just kind of like filed that away in my head. And a couple of years later, I ordered some eggs from a place that's no longer in business. It's called sericulum.com. And they were specifically focused on silkworms for education. So it was sericulture curriculum. And they sent me a packet that was supposed to be 50 eggs and they always send extra. Everybody always sends extra. That's one of those things you find out with silkworms. Um, do not order 2,000 of them. You will get 5,000 of them. And that's a lot. But I, I started with that package of 50 eggs and I ended up with 126 healthy cocoons. And I said, I should make silk from these. They're, they're made of silk. This is awesome. And so I went to my friends at the Weaver's Guild because at that point I was in the Weaver's Guild enough that I, I had you know people there. And I said, wow, I want to I wanna make silk from these cocoons. They're beautiful cocoons. And they're like, no, no, you don't. That's a horrible mess. We did that. We tried it. And they had raised the cocoons, and they had climbed up Hinka Shroen's drapes and got, gotten in the pleats at the top of her drapes and made their cocoons up there. And they got everywhere in the living room. And then they finally did get them gathered and cleaned up and, and undertook to do the reeling. They wound the cocoons onto a clock reel. And then they couldn't find something to wind the silk back off onto. And so they wound it off onto the handle of a wooden spoon, rotating the wooden spoon back and forth to, to wind the silk off of the clock reel. And the problem is that silk, when you work with it wet, is sticky. And it, it became something like an industrial coating on the outside of that spoon. It was just like a, a glaze of silk. And... So then they, you know, that, that didn't work and it didn't make yarn you could work with. And they got basically a spoon covered in silk goo out of their trouble. And they explained all this to me. And I was like, I know. They were like, okay, they've got, they've got special techniques or special tools that we don't have. And so we're going to have to, you know, you're not going to be able to make silk with the tools you have. And so I, I looked at it and I read more about it. I said, okay, I know that this is a stone age technique, not a bronze age technique, a stone age technique, Neolithic. And so I've got to be able to do it with a rock. 
And, and now you may have to have a very special rock and you may need a really good stick to go with it. But I, you know, I said, there's got to be a way. And so I fought with it and fought with it. And I, I, I did a lot of trial and error, a lot of glazed spoon equivalents. And I finally ended up making silk. And the, the main trick that nobody told me that nobody knew about was a thing called croisure. And it's actually a French word. And I'm sure it sounds something more like croisure, but I'm not a French speaker. And so I spell it and say it croisure so that it's easier to remember. But it just means crossing. And the silk is wrapped around itself, around this set of pulleys. And once you know what you're looking for, it's in all the old Chinese drawings. It's subtle. You miss it. But this little, that little noodle in there, yeah, that's, that's the crossing. And it makes the silk work. And so all of a sudden, I could make silk. And I, I started making it and, and working with it and doing, you know, writing articles and, and entering competitions. And it was really kind of fascinating how those things blended together. My, my interest in bugs in the natural world and nature and then my interest in textiles and making and fiber arts just kind of kind of blended together and came this this one thing and it became kind of my thing and i joke about you know somebody asked me one time you know aren't you aren't you worried that somebody else is going to learn your stuff and start teaching and i was like this is my little niche and i have peed in every corner of it because i know that when somebody says we need to find out some silk thing somebody will say ask michael cook because he's the worm spit guy and he will know and so i I love now the fact I actually have grand students, and that makes me immensely happy because I did go through a lot of confusion and frustration when I was first starting out because there was very little information. And that's why when I teach my classes, the handout that I hand out is a 26-page book with illustrations, you know, because I feel like I have almost an evangelism about it. I, was, I, I really feel like this is easy it's inexpensive, it's awesome, it's fun, it looks like magic every time you do it, even if they know what you're doing. And I felt like people were being told, you can't do this. And so I, I just, I really do try to make it as available as possible. That's why there's as much information as there is on my website. That's one of the reasons that I've, you know, I make a point when I'm teaching to try to, try to get as much information into people's brains as possible so that it gets out there. There are so many kinds of ancient or just plain historic textiles that seem impossible to make now. And you hear, well, they, they used to be able to do that, but we can't anymore. And there's that quote that any technology sufficiently advanced seems like magic. And yet what you're doing isn't advanced tech, it's forgotten tech. I did have a class. I um, had a student come in and I, I, I gave that spiel. And she said, well, I'm really pretty new and I don't have a spindle. And so, like half a dozen people said, you want a spindle? Because of course they did, because you know, you're in a room full of yarn people and everybody has six spindles. But she said, actually, can I do the stick and a rock version? And I thought, and I thought, well, we're in the woods and there's sticks and rocks here. And so we actually went out and found, you've got to find a good rock. It's got to be a special rock. It needs to be a round rock, right size, right shape, fairly flat. And you start with a stick laid across the rock to make your spindle. And that's kind of the, the grandfather of drop spindles. But she did the whole class with a rock and a stick. And she did not have as much throughput as the other students do, did working with spindles or spinning wheels particularly. But her quality was excellent. And it does come down to what you were talking about with reverse engineering. The thing is, so many of these ancient technologies give you very little support from the technology which makes you do more with your eyes and your hands. And so many of my tools that I work with for silk, a lot of times when I'm teaching a workshop, I will make people rotate around to all the tools because this one's really modern and really smart and it does a lot of the work for you. And the problem there is that you're not learning, your hands aren't learning to do the work. And so I, I make a point of having each student try multiple different techniques to do the process so that they're not becoming machine operators, so that they're becoming silk reelers, which is understanding how the process works and how you can do it with a stick and a rock because you, you see the threads joining, you see the twist happening, you see the croisure happen, all of these things are, are managed manually 
because I've got one version that it literally adds cocoons on on its own. It has a thing called a jet about. And if you go to one of the factories, it's completely automated. And a person just goes in and basically fixes them when it breaks. But there's the the handmade version is really what's been fascinating the most to me. And it's it's partly because we can do it here. You know, anybody who has access to Home Depot can get enough parts to make to make the simple Croizer that I use. It's basically made out of laundry line pulleys and copper pipe because I wanted something that was easy to get access to. Now I've I've used commercial ceramic pulleys from the textile industry and things like that. And yes, they're they're excellent and yes, they're more effective and but you can't go down to Home Depot and get one. And so I wanted to make something that if as much as possible another person trying to figure out it at home could get their own thing and get started. So you start out with these silk worm eggs. And how do you wind up with silk at the other end? What is the general process for all this? So each cocoon is a single unbroken fiber. It's laid down by the caterpillar over the course of approximately three days. And they make this little figure eight motion with their head back and forth and back and forth, laying down a strand of silk from a gland in the mouth, basically. It, it's, it's manipulated by the mandibles, but it exits under the mouth. And so this strand of silk can be up to 1,500 yards in length. That's about nine-tenths of a mile. And it is vanishingly thin. It's the size of a, like a spider web, but it's measured in a thing called denier. And one denier is one gram per nine kilometers of fiber. And so the strand that comes out of the caterpillar's mouth varies between two and three denier. And so two and three grams for a nine, nine kilometer strand. And so it's so fine, you can't realistically work with one. You know, one kind of floats in the air and, and is, is not manageable. So you take a bundle of them together, and I typically work with about 20, and that gives me about a 40 to 50 denier strand. And the Croizer is a system of pulleys that twists the thread together. And to loosen the thread, I use hot water. So it starts with, I put the cocoons into hot water. I use a brush to rub across the surface of them, and that finds those ends of the unbroken strand. And then I pull off a moderate amount of waste, usually six or eight feet, and then I thread the silk through the croisier, wrap it around itself, and then I start winding it off. Now, I've done a number of different versions of winding when I'm teaching kids. A lot of times, I will actually just have them use a paper towel roll and wind it off around the paper towel roll because all you're doing is winding a thread around a spool. At the moment that it comes out of the caterpillar, it's a string. And the main issue that we have with all of the draft spun fibers, which are, you know, wool, cotton, all these other things, is that you're, if you don't add twist, you don't have cohesion. The thread won't hang together. It'll break. But with silk, it's, it's a thread already. So you have to give it enough tensile strength and you have to give it enough durability. And those things you can add with twist, but it's thread when it starts out. And it's one of the interesting things about that is because it's thread, the only way to join it is a knot. And teaching trained spinners to tie a knot in things, is, it hurts them um, because they're so often trained, you, know, you never, ever, ever, ever knot it. You splice it, you do all these other joins, but you never knot a yarn because it'll make a lump in your finished product. And silk is a thread already, so you can't, you can't splice it. But it's also so slick that if you don't tie a good hard knot in it, it separates. And I do twist most of my silk, but that stage happens after I've done all the reeling. So I will wind it onto a spool, or if I'm using like a Lao technique, I will actually just drop it onto a towel. And in Laos, they're typically using a, looks like a big laundry basket, or sometimes they'll have one that looks like a winnowing basket, and they'll drop it into the basket. And then they'll pick it back up from the basket. And if you've ever done a, a warp chain, you'll, you'll be familiar with it. You can pile it in a great big pile and then pick it straight up. And as long as you don't stir it and you don't pull it sideways and you don't mess with it, it will come straight up very cleanly. And so with the Lao technique, I will cover a towel with a pile of silk and then just pick it back up with a spool. And at that point, it's yarn. 
it, you could, I mean, you could weave with it, you could do things. I typically do add twist because adding twist makes it stronger and more durable. So when I say stronger, I'm talking about ability to resist breaking. And when I'm talking about more durable, I'm talking about ability to resist abrasion. And um, both of those things you get by twisting. And so depending on the yarn structure, just like with any, with any textile craft, the yarn depends on what you want to do with it. And so I can make something called tram, which is low twist, and it's barely twisted. A lot, looking at it at arm's length, you would have to untwist it to recognize that it is twisted. But it is typically between two and five twists per inch. And that makes a yarn that is soft and floppy and loose and very shiny and excellent for brocade and embroidery. If I want to make a warp yarn or like if I want to make sewing thread, I've threaded my sewing thread through my sewing machine on the needle end, not the bobbin end, thank you very much, because that was one of those, I've, I've done it, ha ha ha, and I you know, connected a bunch of stitches on a piece of fabric just to show as an example. But because it's so completely even, it goes through the sewing machine just fine. But to make that yarn, that is a three-ply organzine. And organzine is a plied filament yarn so that you take the the filament that comes off the cocoons and you can i typically will double it or triple it so that i get more bulk to it and twist that and that's that's a single and then i take three of those singles and ply them back together to make the three by three organzine that i use to sew with or to weave with Organzine is not the number. Organzine is just the structure. So it could be a two by ten or a a four by four by two. You know all these different compound structures that make up that yarn. But an organzine is moderately shiny, fairly strong, and resistant to abrasion because those long flat fibers have been twisted. So what they're presenting to the surface is a little tiny portion of fiber instead of that long straight fiber. The tram will tend to snag and pull very easily. If it's in a garment where it receives wear, it will pill. And it's, it's beautiful for embroidery. And if you look at like the, the gorgeous framed Chinese embroideries or the dragon robes or any of those where they've got that long stitching, that's what makes it shine. And a lot of, of uh, the judging, the competition in oriental embroidery is to get that shine. It's measured based on how much light comes off of it. And you do that with low twist yarn. And then for, for things like weaving and knitting, you want a higher twist yarn. So this is what you're doing with uh, all the silkworms that you raise? All of the reeling that I've done with a couple of experimental exceptions has been Bombix. And honestly, most of the yarn that I've produced has been made from commercial cocoons. Because the ones that I make, the ones, the cocoons that I raise myself, that I raise from eggs, it's almost like having your own homegrown tomatoes. They're excellent. They're beautiful. They have challenges. You're going to have to cut around that worm, that part where the sun got on it and it's a little crunchy. You're going to have to kick that part off. Whereas the commercial ones are perfect. They are consistent. They are heavier. The diameter of the fiber is bigger. And so when I'm talking, when I'm teaching, when I'm doing a presentation, I use commercial cocoons from China, which I get from Trinway. And I do that because I need to be able to focus on the conversation and not on what's happening under my hands. What happening, what's happening under my hands need to be, needs to be very consistent, very reliable, and very I don't want to say uninteresting, but it needs to not give me interesting times. <laughs> but uh, because of that, the vast majority of the yarn that I actually end up making is my handmade silk made from commercial China cocoons. I've done projects with my own handmade, hand-raised cocoons, but more often I'm using the commercial ones. I was kind of assuming that this was all part of the same pursuit, that you started at one end and went all the way to the other. But it sounds like raising silk and processing silk are kind of separate pursuits for you. I have a friend who who says that collecting craft supplies and crafting are two separate hobbies. And yes, they are two separate hobbies in the same way that if you had chickens, having chickens and cooking is two separate things, but having chickens gives you eggs, which you use to cook with. I mean, yes, it's, it is, there are plenty of people who raise 
different kinds of especially the giant silk moths they're beautiful they raise them literally for the beauty of the moth and the experience of doing it which is fascinating and it's this whole you know kind of nature show happening in a shoebox in your living room but they don't do anything with the silk and so some of those people have given me their silk they've given me cocoons that i that i use for educational programs or to hand out to kids when i go to schools that kind of thing but there are people on the other side who are grossed out by the caterpillars, never want to see one, but they like reeling silk. And so they buy cocoons and they do that. But I I do like the wholeness of the way that I've done it. I find the, the moth to cloth version very satisfying. And I do, for me, it makes it less, I don't want to say less mysterious because it does still feel mysterious, but to me, it makes it more understood. It makes it, I can look at that and say, I literally made that piece of ribbon from silkworm eggs and sunshine. You know, I, I, I raised the mulberry, I went and harvested the mulberry, I raised the caterpillars, I, I dried the cocoons, all the whole process, I made that thing. And it's, it's, it's very satisfying. So silk is really precious, but we also kind of take it for granted, I think. People think they know what it is. What do people find most surprising when you tell them about silk? Or what are you most excited to talk to people about when you tell them about silk? Oh, wow. Um, silk is awesome. And there's, there's kind of a, an understood version where people, people have heard about it. They've seen the, the brief fact sheet. The main thing that I found that's fascinating that a lot of people don't know is how, how easy it is to do. Once you, once you know those few weird specific tricks, it's not, it's tedious. It's, it's time consuming. It's not hard. It, the, the work that your fingers have to learn to do is, is just like with anything, with crochet or knitting or whatever, you're going to have to learn to do things with your hands. But it's not, it's not something that you know, has to be difficult. Silk is just it's this fantastic fiber. It's made of two proteins. One's called fibroin. Fibroin is the long, shiny fiber. One is called Saracen, and Saracen is a sticky, gummy stuff that acts almost more like starch, but it sticks the cocoon together. I use it to stick my yarn together. And there are actually silk fabrics that are woven what's called in the gum or gummy, and something like organza, if you ever handled silk organza, is very stiff. And you can literally read the newspaper through it because it is so finely woven, but it's got the gum in it. And if you boil the gum out, then it's this suddenly this drapey, soft, floppy thing. And I have a piece that I've literally torn one yard of fabric in half and boiled half of it to show people this is the gum and this is no gum. But the chemical structure of silk is just fascinating. It's made from each strand that comes out of the caterpillar is called a bave. And the bave is made of two brins. And each brin is made of hundreds of little fibrils, and the fibrils are made of microfibrils, and those are made of fibro and protein. And it's just this, I don't know, there's just so much, so much interesting stuff with it. It takes color beautifully. It has a lot of dye sites on the surface of the, of the fiber so that it can take color beautifully. At the same time, it is remarkably refractive and translucent so that light that shines into it bounces back out of it, and it's glossy and has, looks kind of lit from within like no other fiber can be. It's electrically insulating. You'll still occasionally find old cords that will have yarn wrapped around it. That yarn is silk. They've used it in sutures to stitch people together with. It's, it's used in all kinds of different scientific applications. There's some people at Tufts University that are doing some fantastic things with silk-based optics. And they're, they're working on making lenses and things out of silk protein. Just, it's just the whole, silk is magic, just from one end to the other. And there's just so much to it. I'm trying to think of a thing that I know that, that, that people are surprised to hear, other than the part where the cocoon unwinds like a ball of yarn and is this, this magical little tiny thing. Um, just the sheer history and, and the, the massiveness of sericulture around the world because it's been, there's quite firm evidence for at least 5,000 and probably 7,000 years of sericulture. And to me, that, that weight of history is, is fascinating. And to look back at it and think there really were people in, you know, boiling their cocoons in a hand-built clay pot and working with, with pieces of bamboo and pieces of rock to do all these different techniques. 
is is fascinating to me. It's kind of one of those foundational technologies that where would we even be without silk? It's just so kind of fundamental and ingrained into whole processes. One of my, I've got a, a box of unusual things made from silk because there's a lot of things that used to be presumed to be made from silk if it wasn't mentioned otherwise. So like Velvet is made of silk. Sutures were made of silk. Dental floss was made of silk. Because, you know, if you look at it and you think back, you know, 200 years, what are you going to make a strand out of that will be fine enough to floss your teeth with? It's not going to be wool. It used to literally be labeled little boxes said dental silk. But if you bought any of a number of fabrics, so any fabric that said satin, taffeta, velvet, those were always made of silk. And in an older dictionary, you will find the definition will say satin, a fabric made of silk following this structure. And it will explain the structure, but made of silk is just part of that definition. And we've gone to where almost all of those things are, unless it's specifically labeled silk, are synthetic. So if you go buy five yards of taffeta, it will be polyester. If, or rayon, polyrayon. Um, if you go, you know, buy velvet, whatever, it's it's going to be a different, typically synthetic fiber, but it used to always all be silk. And also, it used to always all be reeled silk. And now, especially a lot of times, fabrics are made from spun silk. And all of the the people that I know that spin silk, what they think of as silk, comes in a bump, and it's a loose fluff of tiny fibers. And so they picture all silk yarn being made from fluff. And that is actually produced when you are working with the cocoons and one of the strands breaks. Or if a moth has opened the cocoon and so that cocoon has a busted out end and it can't be unwound anymore because it's no longer one string, Or if your machine snarls, or if a skein tangles, all of these things go into a waste bin. And that waste silk is then degummed in a a chemical bath, it is opened on a carding machine, and it is run through a combing machine, and then it is cut to length and made into roving. And one of my friends was talking about how cotton has this amount of a staple length between an inch and a half and three inches based on the bowl, and wool has a staple length between two inches and five inches based on the breed of sheep and all these different things. And they said, silk has a staple length from five to seven inches. It's longer than the other staples. I was like, you realize somebody made that length with scissors, right? And I've, I've literally watched a video of it from India. They had this giant drum, and it had these little hooks on the side that the silk was caught onto, and then somebody took a big scissors and literally cut in between every one, and that set the staple length of the silk to whatever they wanted. But the, the staple length of silk is what you cut it to with scissors if it's not 1,500 yards. So that idea that silk goes from this industrial scale down to like the, the hand spinner scale, where you know we are not accustomed to thinking of what we use as waste, we're used to thinking of it as raw materials. <laughs> I had this conversation with Jan Louette of, from, from Louette Wheels, and he said, no, we get the grade A number one. I was like, yes, you're getting grade A number one waste. And he said, no, but it's the best stuff. And I was like, yes, it's the best what you can get after all of the reeled silk has been taken out. And I think of it like, a, like butchering a cow. You're always going to take out all of the prime cuts. You take out the sirloins. You take out the, the fillets, all of these New York strips. All these things come out first. And then you have trimmings from any of these pieces. And so you can go to the store and buy ground sirloin. And that is absolutely delicious, high quality ground beef, but it's never going to be the same price per pound as a whole sirloin. And so I think of reeled silk as being the sirloin cut. And then all of the other stuff is made from the trimmings. And there's a lot. Yeah, there's, there is a whole bunch of waste in this process because it's, there's waste at several stages. And so you can get anything from very, very nice to really rough and small and, and, you know, not very pretty at all. And they actually grade the waste. And so you can have everything from 
what Jan Louette was buying, the grade A number one, the really nice stuff that makes perfectly fine even yarn, down to stuff that looks like cotton lint, and it's called Noil, N-O-I-L. And Noil makes a yarn with almost no sheen. It has a little bit of sparkle, but there's no real shine to it like there is. But it also is very cottony and very absorbent and very cool and doesn't wrinkle. And so that silk is, you know, they use every bit of it. They use all the different parts of it. And if you're in a place where it's raised, the bug in the middle, the pupa, is not wasted either. You can feed that to your fish. You can use it to fertilize plants with. You can feed it to chickens. Uh, People eat them, um, different parts of the world. I've actually done festivals and had this person come up to me and say, can I have those? Are you, are you keeping those? Do you take those home? And I, I don't take those home. I do sometimes, if I'm at home, I compost them. When we had chickens, I would feed them to my chickens, but they have a distinctive aroma that I don't care for. I've tried them. I've tasted them. If you've smelled them, they taste like they smell, which is the case with a lot of food. But yeah, I see your face there. You've smelled some, apparently. Um, I, I've had a lot of people that will... So when I, when I do my presentations, like to a school, I will half-jokingly say, you know, this is my can of canned silkworm pupas, and I'm happy to open the can for you if anybody really wants to taste one. But the rule is, once I open it and you see them and smell them, you still have to taste one, and we all get to watch your face. And... Most of the time, this just ends up with people laughing and we all kind of go, yeah, great joke, thanks. But I did this at a high school. And by second period, you know, they knew about it walking in. And by the end of the day, there was nothing in the cans but broth. And I'd gone through all the cans I had in my bag because they were, they were daring each other to, oh, you eat too. Oh, take a picture of it on your tongue. Oh, you know. And what do they taste like? They have a, a texture almost like a cooked egg. And they have a flavor that is somewhere between beanie and fishy, but is distinctly insect. And unless you've tasted other insects, there's nothing quite to explain what insect tastes like, but it's got got that flavor. Um, Their proteins are made very differently than our proteins. So one of the things I hear over and over again about silk fabric is that you can't wash it. You have to dry clean it. And... I'm, you know, not afraid to wash wool by hand, even if it says dry clean only. But what about silk? I mean, you've told me that you are already washing it several times. Do I really have to take it to the dry cleaner? Or can I just dump it in the sink with some wool wash? There's several things that make silk challenging to wash. And most of them are actually not the fiber so much as the textile treatment. So silk fiber is washable. It does shrink it will fade and excessive washing will damage it, but so will perspiration. And so if you get something in silk, it's important to get it back out. But the main thing that doesn't wash are things like calendaring. So if you have a bolt of fabric and you can, you run it through hot rollers with pressure and calendar the fabric and that makes it shiny and even and square woven and all these other things, it's like pressing, but it's done with a big, a big machine. But the calendaring will come off, and the the texture may change the color very often because they make silk that is intended to be dry cleaned only. They will not make it with water fast dyes, and so some silks will spot or or run if you run them in water. But very often it's just the texture. It's the it's the texture of the yarn or the texture of the fabric will change if it becomes wet. And the different some of the dry cleaning processes are not too kind to it either. And it, it's important that the dry cleaner knows that it's silk and knows what they're doing. But silk itself, the fiber, is washable. It's it is the dyes and the and the the fabric finishings and all those things that are not. So speaking of silk fabrics, we've talked about raising silk and turning silk into yarn. And then you are really engaged in making some beautiful fabrics. I think the first piece of cloth I saw you working on was maybe tablet weaving. I do tablet weaving with myself. That's actually one of the things that I've done the most with the silk that I've made. And part of it is that same thing where I was talking about with the the insects and the, the, the yarn stuff or all these different paths in my life and 
another way that I came to Silk was I was doing tablet weaving back when I was in the SCA, and I was doing more and more elaborate work and tinier and tinier. And I was working with J&P Coates dual duty polyester cotton sewing thread and making ribbons that were uh, maybe a half of an inch wide that had letters and figures worked into them with people's names. And one batch had a horse's head, a peacock, a flamingo, and a dagger worked into the ends of them. And one of my friends came up and said, you know, with the amount of work that you're doing, you really should not be using polyester cotton sewing thread. I said, but that's what I can get. And she said, well, here I have some silk. And she gave me this box of Corticelli buttonhole twist. And so I did this this elaborate project with rainbow-colored Lindisfarne biting birds with this, this box of silk. And it was exquisite. And they they literally don't make silk like that anymore because Corticelli was really, really good. And the gem tone colors were brilliant magenta and bright teal and this gorgeous dark purple and I backed it all with a metallic gold thread for all the interlacing patterns. Anyway, I got really fascinated with the way that that silk worked and handled and felt and everything else and that was another one of those little threads that kind of led me toward it. But the nice thing with making something with tablet weaving is that there's very little waste you can get a fairly strong impact with not a lot of yarn, not a lot of total ounces of silk. Now, I can't make something like a shirt with it. You know, it's going to be a ribbon or a bookmark or a necklace or something like that. It's going to be a little strap. But I can do a project that's completed with silk that I've made without having to spend thousands of hours making silk. Um, and that's, that's why I've chosen tablet weaving and embroidery to use my silk with because that's maximum impact for a small amount of thread. A lot of people think I make a lot more silk thread than I do. And I'm a very exploratory crafter. I like doing something to figure it out, but I'm not nearly as patient about then going ahead and, and doing the same thing for eight weeks. And I've got, I've got students who've taken it that way. And there's one of my students that has made this fantastic knitted shawls. And now she's doing knotted miniature carpets. A student of mine named Colleen Nimitz. She took my silk classes, I think, three times and has taken it further than I've ever done. I mean, she's actually gone to Laos and worked on a silk farm to learn about it. But she was one of the ones that I was talking about. She was so concerned when she started teaching silk reeling. She'd been teaching spinning for years. She said, would you feel all right with me teaching this stuff because it's your stuff? And I was like, well, that means that I get out to 60 more people this year that never would have gotten to see my stuff. And no, I have, I have no problem because, you know, she's respectful of what I do. And, and she recognizes me as having, having explored a lot of it. So what kind of silk is your favorite? Ooh, um, gosh, each one of them has their own charms. And it's, it's like saying which one of your kids is the nicest. You know, you've got to figure out there's different, there's different ways. So some of them, Bombix Mandarina for me was the most revelatory. And I raised Bombix Mandarina many years ago, and it was fascinating to see how alike they are with the Bombix Mori and how different. Because they really are, like if you, if you think of Bombix Mori or domesticated ones being a dog, Bombix mandarina is a wolf. And so they are a wild critter. They have wild habits. They have they have natural camouflage. They have a lot of abilities that the hybrids don't. And so watching them, like the, the caterpillars are completely camouflaged to look like a mulberry twig. They literally have the pattern of the bark marked on their skin. They have little hairy things on the bottom of their feet that look like bark scars. And so when, they, when they're startled, they freeze in this, this upright position with their arms held together, and they look like a twig, really, really a lot like a twig. And the domesticated ones have been so domesticated for so long that their behaviors are very human-dependent. So when they're hungry, they literally wave their heads back and forth because they know that a person will come along and drop leaves on them. That's the extent of how they eat. 
but the wild ones will wave their heads back and forth, see that there's no leaves, and start walking. And they'll walk several inches and check for leaves and then walk some more inches and check for leaves because that's, you know, if you're walking on a twig, you know, you get along the twig and there's another leaf. But I'd have to say the most beautiful moths that I've raised are probably Luna's, which is another one of our North American silk moths. They are, the moths themselves are this kind of almost neon lime green and they have these long, elegant tails, and they're just, they're, they're a really beautiful moth. They're not a particularly beautiful caterpillar. And the, probably the prettiest caterpillar I've ever raised is a Texas and Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Mexico species called Coletta. And a Coletta moth, the, the caterpillars are turquoise blue with orange and iridescent black. And they're, they're gorgeous. They're really elegant little caterpillars. You know, you you could have answered about which one you like to reel or which one you like to stitch with, but I love how excited you are about every stage of these moths' lives. Yeah, I really I enjoy that confluence. I enjoy that that joining together of different threads of my interests, and it allows me when I'm teaching it to get across to people in a very different way. Whereas if they saw somebody who only had the bug side or who only had the fiber side, it's it's not as holistic. It's not as as complete an understanding. But being able to show this is a tiny caterpillar and as it eats it gets bigger and bigger and I've got caterpillars in different sizes in different trays across the front of my booth. So I can say hatches out, gets bigger, gets bigger, gets bigger. Here's one spinning a cocoon. And I try to always have them available literally like inside of a toilet paper tube so that you can look through it and see it spinning its cocoon inside to the moth. And then we talk about you get to choose either to have the moth or to have the yarn. You don't get to have both the moth and the yarn because I have to kill the pupa inside of the cocoon. And then showing how the cocoon unwinds. And I've got, typically when I'm doing a talk or when I'm doing a presentation, I've got samples of yarn that I've made, textile pieces that I've done, like embroidery, and then silks from around the world showing different styles and preparations of the fiber. And so I do love having those two disparate things coming together because it it does feel very whole. Now, whenever I talk to anybody who's interested in learning about silk, the name of your website always comes up as this really useful, memorable resource. (laughs) Wormspit.com. I love that URL. It is short. It's unique. It's gross. So it's memorable. Somewhat ironically, about the same time that I was putting together wormspit.com, there is a metal band named Wormspit. And I haven't ever communicated with them because we're in such completely different worlds that we don't represent a conflict. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know which of us had had it first because it really was about the same time. And that was before everything was quite as widely broadcast on the internet. I started raising silkworms in 2001. I started on uh, posting on LiveJournal and back before Facebook and any of those others. But then I set up wormspit.com, I think in 04, and and started doing uh, talks for, actually, my first thing was a, a fiber arts event called Kid and You in Bernie, Texas. And I, I went down there and gave a, a talk there, a, kind of a, a walking demo, and just kind of took off from there. So I've been doing it now for over 20 years. One thing I'm curious about is that you can, you know, raise or certainly process silkworms in lots of different places, but it's so connected with China, Laos, Vietnam, India. You don't usually hear it that much in connection with Texas. What's that kind of cultural confluence like for you? I do always feel a little self-conscious being a white dude at the Asian festival representing China. And there's not a Chinese person at the Asian festival who knows what I'm doing. They, I mean, they know what I'm doing in the sense of, look what he's doing over there, but they couldn't do it. There's not anybody, because it is, it's like so many of our textile techniques. You know, somebody could look at it and say, oh, she's making yarn with a spinning wheel, but they couldn't sit and do it. I did have a kind of a magical experience with that at one of the Asian festivals. This old man, probably 75, you know, comes over and he looks and he looks and 
and his eyes get bigger and he like takes a deep breath and he runs off. And then I turn around and he's dragging this this 30-something man and this woman and two or three kids and he's explaining things in very fast Mandarin. And I realized after back and forth with, with all of them, he grew up with silkworms where he lived in China and his son had never seen them. And so he got to show his son and his grandsons this thing that was a big part of his life when he was growing up because a lot of a lot of people in parts of asia not so much now in china because it's more industrialized but if you live in laos or vietnam or different parts of india the chances of you having a couple thousand silkworms every year are pretty great you know that's a thing that you can have like chickens you can have a little rack of of trays in the backyard and half a dozen mulberry bushes and you can just raise some silkworms for a little what they call butter and egg money, you know, a little bit of extra income, or you may make fabric, you know, you may actually have the whole, the whole thing at your house, but it was just neat to see somebody having that, that experience of being able to share their own culture. And like I said, I do feel very conscious of the fact that this is not my culture. I'm sharing this information that fascinates me and I've never had anybody come up and and be mad at me about it, but I have had a number of people come up and say, why are you doing the China part? It's like, well, that's they asked me to do the China part. They asked me to be here. But I've I've done a lot of programs in places like the Asian Art Museum where there's all this this towering culture around me, but I'm the one that knows the silk. There is an element of like preserving the knowledge so that it can be done by someone, um, even if it's not your, say, air quotes, birthright. There's a, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine named Brian Whitehead. And he lives in a little tiny mountain village in Japan and owns a silk farm. And he raises his own silkworms. He raises his own indigo and tea and persimmon tannin and does all these traditional Japanese techniques. And he's learned them for the most part from villagers. And they will bring buses of school kids out to see his stuff and on one of the shows that he was on on Japanese TV, one of the one of the commentators was saying, "Why is a white person preserving our culture, and we're not doing it?" And I get it. I feel like cultural appropriation is a, is a challenge with that. But at the same time, you know, the work is is inspiring and fascinating and interesting, and and I want it to I want it to live and thrive. Well, and there was silk in America. There have been several significant attempts. Um, There were colonies that came over with a mission to raise silk. They raised silk in Jamestown. The Quakers raised silk. The Shakers raised silk. The Mormons raised silk. And each time, it's fairly certain that it failed for lack of labor cost because it is labor intensive and you could make more money selling tobacco or selling cotton or some some other different crop. But they were making silk. I've got a report of the Secretary of Agriculture from somewhere in the 1880s. I don't remember the exact date, but it has a whole section, like a whole section on sericulture. And it lists the different states in the U.S. in the 1880s that were shipping cocoons and where they were going to filatures to be reeled and who was producing them into fabric. And all this stuff was done here and nobody knows about it. Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows where the equipment went. The most recent one that was a serious effort was in the 40s, and it was in Mineral Wells, Texas. And there was a guy who wrote a book, and I've actually got a scan of the book on my website because I've, I've got a copy of the book. But he felt that part of the, the resources that had led Japan to have imperial aspirations had to do with its wealth from silk. And he felt that America should be making silk on its own and not depending on Japanese imports. And so he set up a factory and planted acres and and had a crew and and wrote a book. But nobody in in Mineral Wells knows about it. Because I've I've called the Mineral Wells Historical Society and they're like, the who? And I said, let me send you a copy of this book. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was learning pretty recently that not far from where I grew up in Manchester, Connecticut, there was a lot of silk industry and it actually wasn't that long ago. Well, and Connecticut was the heart of it. I mean, that that kind of northeast Connecticut, New Jersey, New Hampshire was where Corticelli was. That's where a lot of the silk mills were. And they did stop raising the silkworms and started 
working with imported silk. So almost all of the the Corticelli and the Richardson and all of those big mills were uh, Hemingway were dealing with silk that was purchased. And so they would purchase raw filament in skeins. It actually came into Western Canada and there were special silk trains, which like were express trains without stops that went across Canada to get to the American Northeast to the mills. And they were transformed there into all kinds of fabric, but they started from silk filament that was produced in, in Japan or China. And there's, there is a library on the website and it's a link to um, a list of books that some of them are actually in my personal collection that I collected and sent to the University of Arizona for scanning. And others are either Google Books results or they are ones that the University of Arizona had already in their collection that I get permission to host on my site as well. Unfortunately, the University of Arizona collection is no longer available. And Ralph Oswald that was, was digitizing all these books passed away. Griswold, I'm sorry. I don't know if you can still get any of it. I'll have to look and see. I just heard that name, Ralph Griswold, recently myself. I was talking to Chris Bruland at handweaving.net for an upcoming episode. And the Griswold collection is now part of handweaving.net. They have a couple hundred documents relating to silk, along with other historic textile resources um, scanned as part of their library. So, hey, happy news. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that somebody's still got it. That was something that was kind of a passion project for him. Google Books is also excellent for a lot of this stuff because so much of it is out of print. So much of it is no longer in copyright. And that's one of the things that I find it's it's makes it less of a challenge to try to do it the way they did it 100 years ago. If you can find the books from 100 years ago, then you know, you're not you're not trying to figure out the way that they're doing it now with books that you can't get. And that is one of the nice things about a Stone Age technology is it hasn't changed a lot. <laughs> Well, Michael, thanks so much for your time and for explaining all these new ways of looking at silk. Of course. Thanks to Trainway Silks and Handweaving.net for sponsoring this episode. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again. Thanks again.